to Point Baptist Church. As you can tell from your sofas, we are uh, filming at church. It's going to be an online service. Um, sadly, we've had a technical fault at church, an electrical fault, um, and this is in the process of getting fixed. Um, so everyone can watch at home today and, uh, and relax. We're going to bring you some great worship today to your home. We've got some great word as well um, as Ruben is talking about the, um, the, the subject of trust and our, in our series of Abraham. I'm Nate, I'm the youth leader here at church and uh, it's a privilege to be able to talk to you adults as well as the youth. So uh, great. One thing to note, we are gonna, we're going to have communion together today so I want you to go and get your, uh, your drink, your, your bread of choice um, and have a seat and we're going to have the privilege of having that together. I've got a, a scripture as well that really ties in with, uh, with this, this subject of communion, of what Jesus did for us. And we're going to find this in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. If you want to get that in your Bibles, and I'll read it for you now. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's just think on those words now as we're going to go into our time of worship, that Jesus is exalted above every name. Let's exalt him together. Oh 
and um, I'm sure you were singing your hearts out on your sofas um, or wherever you are. Um, we're going to go into that time now of uh, communion um, together. So if you've got your, your wine, your Vimto, whatever you want to drink, and your breads um, ready, that'd be great. One of my favourite uh, symbols of, of the communion is that breaking of bread, of coming together um, as a church, as a family. Um, something I'm really, really thankful about the, of Jesus dying and giving that example of love, that example of sacrifice. So we can do this together. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made, the penalty that you, you paid, your life that you, you laid down for us. It's such an amazing symbol of of love of love for us i pray lord that we we really take on that symbol of love of loving one another one another um there's a very broken world that we live in uh, a world where there's hate a world where people are hurting um, we pray that we take on these challenges of of loving one another we love our neighbor as you loved us. What a symbol of love. Thank you, Lord, for the blood that you spilt for us and your body that was broken for us. I pray, Lord, that we just take on this time of remembering that together and worshipping you, worshipping you as you deserve. Take the bread.
continuing that that theme there of of community of breaking of bread we love the family that is connected with this church we love the um we love the sense of uh, when we are together and uh, as a family we care for one another and we love one another and there's a couple of names that we want to we want to lift up uh, to God right now we want to lift up their names uh, we we believe in a God of miracles we believe a God in a God that uh, is miraculous who can do wonders and a God that can heal so we want to pray and lift up these names David and Maggie and pray God that would, would heal you we pray for Mark. God would step into your world and, and heal you. We pray for John. We pray that God will lift you up, that God will um, do those miracles in your life. We believe in that. We pray for Christina, that God will just bring absolute healing to, to you right now. Right now in your living room, that you'll feel God's uh, touch on you. And we pray for Wayne. Pray we pray that he'll feel peace, that he'll feel um, God's presence and healing will, will come to you, Wayne. We thank, thank God for each and every one of you and we're so grateful for you. Um, we're now going to take up the, uh, the offering. Uh, again, a great symbol of uh, community. Um, this church is, does uh, a lot for the community and uh, we want to get behind that with our finances in whatever way we can. So uh, the um, details are going to be up on your screen now. pray together before we turn to God's word. So Father, we thank you that you are such a kind and a good Father. And so I pray right now that you envelop us in your presence so that we hear your voice, we hear what you're saying to us, and that you are able to transform us and change us. So would you come speak and would you come transform in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. So over the past four weeks, we've been hanging out in the story of Abraham. And for those of you who have been at Alton Towers this past week, you know who you are. Uh, the story of Abraham is a story all about roller coasters. It's a bit of oblivion and a bit of nemesis and a bit of re ah all chucked into one. So roller coaster number one, Genesis chapter 12. God tells Abraham to go, to go from his country, to go from his people, to go from his father's household, and to go to a new land, a land that God was giving him. And Abraham, he goes just like that. Now that's trust. But as soon as he lands in the new land, the land that God's provided to him, He's off because a famine struck and he doesn't trust that God will provide. So what we have is from faith to failure in the blink of an eye. Roller coaster number one. Roller coaster number two is Genesis chapter 15 and Genesis chapter 16. God goes and reveals his covenant to Abraham. He will become the father of a great nation and his descendants will be as numerous as the stars. And Abraham dares to believe just like that. Now that's trust. But as soon as the promise is revealed, he goes and takes control of it. He goes and tries to speed it up by sleeping with Hagar, his servants, and producing a lad who was never ever destined to be his heir. From faith to failure in the blink of an eye. Roller coaster number two. Roller coaster number three is Genesis chapter 17 and 18. So God seals 
this new covenant with Abraham in the sign of circumcision. And Abraham steps into it just like that. Now that's trust. But as soon as the deal struck, Sarah, that's Abraham's wife, Sarah steps away from it. She's way too old. She's 90, way, way, way too old to have a baby. So she steps away from the God who can go perform outrageous miracles from faith to failure in the blink of an eye. Roller coaster number three. But you know what? God goes makes good on his promise. Can we check out the next bit of the story? So if you can, grab your Bible. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Genesis chapter 21. And we're going to read verses 1 to 7. This is what it says. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son that Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children Yet yeah, I've born him a son in his old age. Wow. Wow. Abraham's 100 years of age. Sarah's 90. But God made a promise. And for God, a promise is a promise. Abraham's 100 years old. Sarah's 90. But God made a covenant. And for God, a covenant's a covenant. He promised that Abraham would be the father of a great nation. That his descendants would be as numerous as the stars that his offspring would be greater than all the sand on all the beaches in the whole wide world. And in producing Isaac, he did what he'd said that he'd go do. Wow. Wow story, eh? Which makes the next bit of the story incredibly weird. Can you grab your Bibles again? Here we go. Genesis chapter 22. Next chapter. And this time I'm going to read from verses 1 through to verse 19 says this, some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moria. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Wow. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on that boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld him from me, your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will 
provide. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And to this day it said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Wow. That was a bit weird, eh? Wow. Way, way, way back in a, in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans, somewhere on the Syrian and Turkish border, God speaks to Abraham and tells him that he's going to become a dad in his old age. And his kid will be the start of a dynasty that would be so vast and so immense and so huge that nobody could possibly ever start counting it. And so over the next maybe 30 years or maybe 40 years or maybe 50 years, God speaks to Abraham on at least seven different occasions, telling him that he's going to be the father of many nations. And now God's made good on his promise. Now that God's making his dreams come true, now that his boy's been born, God wants Abraham to go kill him. God wants Abraham to go kill his son. That doesn't make sense. It's a bit weird, eh? Now you and, and me sitting on your sofa at home um, just read that bit of the Bible. You and me, um, we know it's only a test. We know that it's only God testing Abraham, testing his faith and testing his trust. Because look at verse 1. It tells us this, sometime later, God tested Abraham. But you know what? For Abraham, it is totally real. On roller coaster number one, Abraham knows he let God down. On, a, on roller coaster number two, Abraham knows he let God down. On, on roller coaster number three, Abraham knows that Sarah let God down. And so now stepping onto roller coaster number four, he has absolutely no plans, no plans whatsoever to go let his God down. Even if it means this. Even if it means this, even if it means this most horrendous, grotesque of things. Can you begin to imagine what's going through Abraham's mind? And yet, despite this gut-wrenching horror, Abraham decided to trust. So without hesitation, the day afterwards, he gathers the wood, he gathers the fire, the flame, he gathers the knife, and sets out with his boy on a journey which was about 50 miles and would take at least three days to a place called Moriah. And on top of that mountain, he builds his altar, he lays Isaac on top of the wood, and he reaches out for his knife. And God speaks, Abraham, don't lay a hand on the boy, Abraham. Don't do anything to him, Abraham. Now I know that you fear God, because you've not withheld your son from me, your only son. Wow, test over. Do you know what? Abraham's finally got it. Abraham's roller coaster or ride of, of trust followed by fail and trust followed by fail and trust followed by fail is all at an end. On top of Mount Moriah, Abraham steps into 100% trust and 100% faith. 100% dependence and 100% devotion and 100% reliance. On top of Mount Moriah, Abraham completes his journey into faith. His journey into faith. Guys, you know what? It's probably be a, about time that you and I did the same. But before we work out what God wants us to go do, uh, can we just stop and pause for a moment and, and check out this idea concerning Abraham's boy, Isaac. There's a theory going around, and I think it's quite interesting, um, that Isaac is the first recorded person in the history of the whole wide world 
who actually had learning difficulties. Just think about it for a moment. Think about today's story. Think how easily um, Isaac allowed his dad to tie him up and allowed his dad to place him on the wood and allowed his dad to place him on the place of sacrifice without complaining, without murmuring. Or oh, think about a, a later story concerning Isaac. Think about how easily Isaac's son Jacob tricked him into believing that he was in fact his brother Esau so that Jacob could go steal Esau's inheritance as the oldest son. Now, I don't really know. Um, it's just a theory. But you know what? It's the kind of thing that my God would do. The kind of thing that my God would do to go and show how inclusive his kingdom really is. To make someone with learning difficulties one of the greatest heroes in, in your faith and in my faith. Do you know what I mean? I don't know, but that's the kind of God that I worship. Let's mosey on back to the story and to the message of the story. And I think the message of the story today is all about control. It's about control freaks. I kind of think the story of Abraham is a message to control freaks, to people like you and me who like to control stuff, to people like you and me who like to seize control of everything in our lives, like, like our jobs and like our career paths and like our retirement plans and, uh, and like where we live and where we go on holiday and even what our church should look like. Uh, and people who like to control what percentage of our money and what percentage of our lives and what percentage of our time do we give to God and what percentage do we keep for ourselves? Control freaks. I kind of think a whole bunch of us are, if we're totally honest, to some extent, control freaks. You know, Abraham certainly was. Yeah, I know there were loads of times in his life where he actually let God take center stage, where he allowed God to sit on the throne of his life, where he chose to trust his God. But there were actually loads and loads and loads of times where Abraham seized control. Like when he seizes control and marches off to the land of Egypt as soon as famine rocks up and he marches off into near disaster for him and his family. Or like when he sees his control and he goes and sleeps with Hagar in order to speed up his dynasty and his destiny, which causes a massive family row and family rift. Or like when Sarah chose to trust her biological clock, which said that women in their 90s could not and would not ever get pregnant, rather than trust in the power of El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. Do you know, Abraham and Sarah, they, they were awesome people. I've loved this, um, this, this, this series over the past four weeks. I've loved getting into Abraham and hearing his story. They were amazing people. They were great people. But they were certainly control freaks. So the story of Abraham is actually the story of God taking Abraham on a journey, a journey into faith a journey into trust, a journey into reliance, a journey into dependence on him, a journey where God talks with him and walks with him and disciples him and sometimes corrects him until the moment on Mount Moriah where Abraham finally gets it, where he finally chooses to trust, where he finally chooses to have faith, where he finally chooses to give up control to his God. Guys, what would, what would your life look like? Or maybe what would our world look like if you and I went and chose to do the same? What would our marriage look like? What would your marriage look like if we allowed God to make the decisions and take control? And what would your, your family life look like if you allowed God to make the decisions and take control? And what would your job look like if you allowed God to make the decisions and take control? Uh, what would your career plans and your career dreams and your career, career hopes and your career aspirations uh, actually look like if you allow God to make the decisions and take control? Uh, what would your time look like? Or, or what would your finances look like? Or what would this church look like? Or what would your future look like if you allowed 
God to make the decisions and take control. What, what would life look like if we stopped being in charge of it? If we actually took ourselves off the throne of our life, if we stopped it all being about me, myself and I, and actually allowed God to take center stage, what would it look like? What would it look like? What would our whole existence look like? If instead of seeking to be happy or seeking first and foremost to be content in life or, or, or seeking to be fulfilled in life, what would it look like if we actually allow God's purposes for our life to be achieved? What if we woke up tomorrow morning and we said, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. What would it look like if we woke up tomorrow morning and said, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey? What would it look like if we woke up tomorrow morning and said, Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be, all of my ambitions, hopes and plans, I surrender these into your hands. What would it like? What would it be like tomorrow morning if we woke up and the first thing we said to our Lord and our God, our master and our king, our everything, if we said to him, I give myself away. I give myself away. I give myself away for you to use me. Guys, what if tomorrow morning you began a new chapter in your life? called trust. Can we pray together? Let's pray. So we've been banging on about this word trust and faith for four weeks now. I just wonder whether there are people here this morning on your sofa at home or wherever you are who know that God's speaking. Maybe you're people like me who have trust issues. Where we've given ourselves to God, but we've retained about 75% of our character and our life and our money and our home and our dreams and our career. Do you have trust issues? Do you like me have trust issues? And yet the almighty God of heaven and earth, El Shaddai, the one who is Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. Our father is saying, come and bring it to me, lay it at my feet. Walk with me, trust me, have faith in me, depend on me, rely on me, be devoted to me because I know the best path for your life. I know the thing that's best for you. Step into my stuff, step into my plans, step into my ambitions and I'll lead you on an amazing journey to a wonderful promised land. Father, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry where we've got it wrong. There's a throne in our heart and a throne in our mind, a throne in our heart all to do with our emotion, a throne, a throne in our brain all to do with our intelligence. And you're supposed to be front and center on the throne of our heart and the throne of our brain. And yet right now, for too long and for too often, I've been there. I've been on the center of my throne of my heart and the center of the throne of my brain. And now it's time for me to step away and say sorry for that. And ask you to be enthroned. Father, I want to walk with you and I want to talk with you and I want to hang out with you and I want to learn from you and I want to be discipled by you. I want to be mentored by you. I want to be inspired by you. I want to fall deeper and deeper into love with you. I want this church to fall deeper and deeper and deeper into love with you, to step into the stuff of their destiny because they are walking the walk of their father. Father, would you forgive us and would you help us to step into trust that tomorrow morning we wake up and we say all for Jesus. All I am and have and ever hope to be, all of my ambitions, 
all of my hopes, all of my plans, I surrender these into your hands. Father, I suspect that it will only be when we go all in, when we jump in with both feet, where we go 100% trust and 100% faith, where we go 100% you, I think it will only be then that we'll truly understand our identity, we'll truly understand our position, we'll truly understand our role, we'll truly understand the beauty of life. And Father, this church today says, here we are. Here we are. We trust. We trust in the Lord with all our hearts. We don't rely on our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge you and know that you will make our path straight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, oh for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Jesus, oh for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. All of my ambitions, hopes and plans. I surrender these into your hands. All of my ambitions, hopes, and plans, I surrender these into your hands. For it's only in your will that I am free. For it's only in your will that I am free. Jesus, oh for Jesus, all I to be all of my ambitions hopes and plans I surrender these into your hands all of my ambitions hopes and plans I surrender these into your hands for it's only in your will that I am free for it's only Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Ruben, for, uh, for teaching us a little bit more on the story of Abraham um, and that picture of trust. Wouldn't it be amazing this week to really take that on board, to... Uh, in whatever situation you find yourself in, your workplace, your school, your family, your marriage, whatever it is, to trust God with everything. Um, it's a challenge, but uh, with God behind us and God going before us, we can, we can do it in the power of, power of him. 
Amazing. So I've got a couple of announcements, everyone's favourite part. Um, we have a church meeting which is happening um, this Tuesday, the 20th, at 8 o'clock. It's going to be in the building, so um, look forward to seeing you all there and gathering together. Uh, we also have, next Sunday is going to be in person, so um, God's blessed people with the skills in, in fixing electrical things. Uh, so um, really happy that we can be back together um, and uh, to see you all uh, uh, as we worship. And um, the other thing about Sundays as well is that it's going to be in the mornings only for um, the summer. So up until September, it's going to be a morning service. We also can gather more together, um, but we're still going to be uh, having to book online. So uh, you could do that um, on the website, go onto the website and uh, make sure you book online how many people are coming and it would be great to see you all there. Maybe the most exciting announcement of all is uh, a youth announcement, but um, definitely need people to, to come on board for us to do a bit of a mammoth task. Um, ourselves and PCF, the youth leader there, Josh Bull, the awesome Josh Bull, um, we had the idea of putting on a, a youth camp together. It took a bit of a, a time to find the right place at the right price, um, but as you all know, last summer and this summer, a lot of the uh, places that we usually go to, uh, the festivals, the camps, aren't going to be on. So we thought, why not bring it to our own backyard? Uh, we've got a festival that's going to be called Rooted Festival. This is a symbol of uh, us being rooted in this neighbourhood, celebrating the fact that we're, that we're here. We have such great surroundings. Uh, we have a great church um, here and at PCF but also a symbol of being rooted in Christ, getting those deeper roots together. So we've got a great theme, we've got a great site. Um, what we do need is um, tents. So if anybody's got like a tent knocking about, a two-man tent, three-man tent, um, those would be appreciated. And anybody else who feels like they want to get on board and putting this on so that we can um, uh, really invest in these young people's lives, it'll be awesome. So uh, get in touch with myself, um, and the team, um, whether you want to get on board, it would be great. Uh, have a fantastic rest of your Sunday. Can't wait to see you soon in person. God bless.